Ding. Woo. All Here right. we are recording. We are. We're recording. Keep talking. Right. It's cool. It's, you know. I'm now I'm nervous. I can't I can't talk anymore. <laughs> it's all right, Terry, start talking. All right. Uh, hi, guys. I'm Terry Colton. Uh, I'm the winemaker here at uh, Levine Yang. And uh, today. No, we... no, wait. Not yet, Terry. Not yet. All right. I thought you said start talking. I'm yelling. I'm on the roll now, bro. Joji, <laughs> quit instigating. Sorry. He said, hey. he said yeah, I went. So, yeah. I, know. <laughs> I know my cues. I know. That's a professional. That was pretty good, Terry. <laughs> oh, the Hewitts are here from Ohio. They are. Yep, they they probably come to everyone. They do, they're awesome. So, hey, Steve and Martha, thanks for joining us again. Columbus, Ohio, and they uh, they couldn't find a Ranchero Cellar Chrome in the cellar, so they're opening an Alta Canlina Garnache, perfect for this heat. So it's, it's warm now, uh, apparently, there in Ohio, because uh, uh, I think just a couple shows ago, you guys were freezing over there. So it's uh, it looks like you skipped spring, so. Yeah, as we, we're still solidly in the spring here with the wind and all of those dogwoods or cottonwoods or whatever they're blowing that stuff across town. I know if my camera goes off, it's because I need to blow my nose. My nose has been running all day. And my, this the wind has my allergies just full throttle. Yeah, every everybody's been dealing around Paso, so we'll get going here pretty soon. Uh, but uh, welcome everybody who is on the Zoom side. I know that over on the Facebook side of things, we're just waiting for stuff to uh, to sync and catch up, but I think we're getting there. I know I'll get a text from someone on the team that will tell me uh, where we're at with things over there. So, but thanks for everyone for promoting it and getting it out there. Joe, I saw yours that I know you didn't do, but- uh, Hey, who's to say I didn't do it? I'm super savvy like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Did you no. say thank you no. to Barry? No, that wasn't even Barry. That was my wife. My wife is the one who uh, is uh, a uh, the Facebook uh, machine when it comes to our social media, our social media presence. So you know, and she's trying to she's trying to hand that off. Uh, she's 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 tired of trying to be uh, the um, you know keeping social up media. It. It's a Maven. lot. It's a lot. I mean, once you start looking into it, man, it's a ton of time. Yeah. yeah. And actually doing it well actually takes a fair amount of skill. So, well, we have Jen Bravo on our team that does it, and she does pretty good. So, uh, we'll, we'll keep her around a little while longer. There you go. Pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> she does all right. <laughs> Toronto, ringing endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's, long, that's my last time giving you crap. Oh, <laughs> I don't think that's true. All right, so <laughs> let's get rolling here. Uh, awesome, everybody. Thank you again for joining us for another Paso Wine Hour. Uh, I'm Chris Toronto with the Paso Robles Wine Country Alliance, and we are stoked that you're with us. Before I start today's show, if you're watching this and you think that there is a wine festival in the park this Saturday, uh, there is not. So please what? show up on Saturday with tickets that you bought last year or whatever, or just think you can buy them at the at the door, uh, because we do not have a wine festival this year in the park. Just trying to make that clear. Uh, we've had a lot of calls to our office saying, can we come? Is it sold out? What's happening? Uh, I think nowhere on our website or anywhere else have we said that there is a wine festival happening with 3,000 people and 70 wineries in the park. I know that sounds super fun and we'd love to do it, honestly, um, because I, I really do dig it. I, it would have been my 15th or 16th one uh, this year, uh, but uh, next year. So please don't show up at the park. But you know why it's not happening, Chris, is because it's only going to be 70 degrees, 75 degrees, you know, <laughs> it can't happen at that temperature. It has no, to be exactly. at least it's 95 90. to 100 for the park to work. <laughs> you have to have people passing out. If, you, if yeah. it's cool, you know, it's not going to work. No, exactly. You know, and, and red wine at slightly below boiling. Um, <laughs> yes. that's, that's, that's the way it has to happen. Sad. I can't, I can't roll out my barrels there like we did back in the old days, you know, show up there at six in the morning, you know, 
Bloody Mary full kind of thing, trying to get your barrel stacked. That was the old school way of doing it, man. That was uh, that was Remember that might have been that might have been for your time, Toronto. No, nope, I helped do that. I was uh, I was there. That's when the whole park was open and everybody was running around. It was definitely yeah, that was different. Hard. Those are different yeah. days for sure. Well, we, we can we can get into that later if you guys want. But for now, today's show is on white wines on Blanc. We called it what the Blanc. Uh, because we're going to have a few, and as you can tell, by the way, these guys are no, not shy about talking at all or even going off subject at all. Um, but so I, we've, we've got some fun people to talk to today. Uh, we have uh, Terry Colton with Lavigne Winery, Amy Butler with Ranchero Cellars, and Joe Barton with Barton Family Wines. I want to gi give each person just a, a quick second to be able to say who they are, their brand, all that good stuff real quick. So let's start with Terry. Terry Colton. Hi, I'm Terry. Uh, uh, I'm the winemaker here at Lavigne Winery. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we've been doing Saw Blanc for a long time here. Uh, it's always one of the first grapes to ripen. So um, it's a really fun white. I enjoy making white. I've made white for years here. I've been, I've been around the area. I've known these three characters for more years than any of us will admit to. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, white wines are, are brilliant. I love them. Um, they're, they're definitely the unsung hero of Paso and, uh, you know, on a hot summer day, there's nothing like a nice, cool, crisp white wine to sort of refresh yourself, uh, in the afternoon. So awesome. Cool. Thanks, Terry. We'll get a little bit more into Lavigne and who Lavigne is, where you guys are uh, later on. Amy Butler with Ranchero Cellars. Hi. Welcome. Amy Butler. I remember when Terry was blonde. I still blonde. It's platinum now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am. I own Ranchero Cellars, and it's a very, very small brand. Um, I have a little tasting room in downtown Paso. Uh, I've been making white wine since the beginning. When I when I started Ranchero, the very first wine that I made and released was a Grenache Blanc. So I'm excited to talk about the Grenache Blanc today. And um, I think Paso Robles is, um, is really, uh, with its cool nights, there are certain white varieties that just do so well here. And I think, I think all three of these are, um, are on that list. So I'm excited for today's tasting. Cool. Right on, right on. And Joe Barton, Barton family, as well as Gray Wolf. How's it going, everybody? Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, so Joe Barton, Barton Family Winery, Gray Wolf. Uh, yeah, we've kind of always been making a little white wines. Funny, uh, Amy was just saying, I remember my very first wine in uh, 1996 was a Sauvignon Blanc. So uh, that's kind of how I got my feet wet in the industry too. And uh, it's really cool to see the evolution of Paso Robles in general, to see how the white wines have grown out of, um, you know, even when I worked for Kendall Jackson a long time ago, you know, Paso Robles was a source of white fruit, uh, but it really necessarily wasn't geared towards what we were trying to make here. And it'll, it'll be fun to see, you know, how well Sauvignon Blanc does, but then see and kind of, you know, talk and show the experience of how Rhone whites have evolved in this area and have become just a larger player in the whole, the whole scheme of things. And I think, you know, we've got the good fortune of starting to, uh, create the viticultural side of, of white wines in this area that necessarily didn't, you know, exist 20 something years ago, but it really exists now. And it's cool that you guys and the, the Alliance has given us a platform to talk about it today. And hopefully we'll, yeah. we'll get some information out there for y'all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that is very true. You know, when we host a lot of trade and media for that matter, I think a lot of the times, uh, and this is starting to change, it's starting to evolve, uh, but they come with this kind of preconceived notion that, oh, it's Paso, it's red wine. Um, but yet we always tend to surprise them with, with our white wines. As a matter of fact, in our, we have a, um, a, a buyer's tour that we do for people who buy for on or off premise uh, uh, locations that uh, always in the fall, and we have a seminar uh, associated with it typically uh, all on white wines. It's usually the morning seminar and it's either the first morning or the second morning, of course, uh, but that seminar, I think, always walks away as being the one that has the greatest impact on everybody because it kind of blows their mind like, oh, wow, yeah, Paso is. And you've got buyers from all over the country. So it means where a lot of people totally understand uh, that we, we can actually produce some really great white wines. Uh, it's great to, to watch people's eyes light up and, and change a few minds out there. Uh, and, so, and I specifically asked these three panelists 
uh, and winemakers today uh, to talk because they've often been uh, really vocal about white wines and and I've also made wines in uh, whether it be for different brands or just over such history of time that have been a part of some of those seminars in the past and have always been really great to be a part of it. Joe, I'm going to start with you though because with Barton Family Wines and with Grey Wolf, I mean, it, it feels like when the Barton Family label kind of was was created, you had like four or five skews of white wines, and and you you have an interesting story about uh, traveling and finding some white wines that you enjoyed and wanting to kind of mirror here, and I'd love for you to share that. Yeah, I mean, still do. I think, you know, and I don't know, I, I can't speak for Terry or Amy, but I really drink a lot more white wine than I do red wine. I mean, for me, it was always about that was really what I was drinking more on a regular basis. I, I feel like from a, you know, <laughs> as you get older and your 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 palate evolves and your your diet evolves, you start finding that heavy red wines don't really fit into the overall mantra of what you're consuming in, on a on a regular basis. So, uh, that kind of started the program. And then when I was traveling, like you said, I was so enlightened, you know, by every place I went, there was a white wine that was really the thing that kind of um, <clears throat> surprised me the most or kind of intrigued me the most because generally, yeah, when you would go to cafes or when you go to places that would be kind of the center hub of a, of a village or a region, you'd always start with a white wine, like you were saying, like breakfast wine, you know, I mean, like people would get up in the morning and you're like, hey, let's let's have some wines, you know, like when I went to Portugal the last time, I mean, geez, man, we drink in Alvarinhos and, and, you know, pick pulls or whatever the heck they called it back in Portugal. And, and I was so kind of wrapped into those. And I think it started in Spain for me was one of the first times uh, that I was able to uh, really experience that. And then after that, I mean, you know, it kind of went hand in hand with like, Hey, what can we do in Paso? You know, uh, and I don't think everybody had the knowledge as much as they do now as far as the terroir, the soil, and, you know, the, the chase that we all kind of started to kind of look into, like, you know, let's find some sites, let's find some areas. And then, you know, I, I know when we get into the wines, we'll all have that conversation about these maybe were old vineyards that were taken out to put white wines in. Maybe they were grafted or maybe they are original plantings in, in, in virgin ground that were specifically geared to a white wine and it is hard and, I, and i'm sure everybody will weigh in on this is getting growers to commit to it they don't think that there's the value to it they don't necessarily believe that hey this is going to be a crop for me and i'm like it's a it's a sales pitch and anybody who's done it generally looks back and goes that was a great call i mean it's a good yielder the quality is there the the dollars actually work but you know they all want the the prize grape like oh can we plant this and this and this Cabernet Grenache, Syrah or whatever. Those, those are the, 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 the high dollar grapes. You're like, it isn't necessarily about that. And that's what I think we're pushing here today is like, we want to get people more wrapped up into the, into the culture of cool white wines we do here. Yeah, absolutely. Amy, you know, you've worked for maybe a few different brands or at least consulted and made wines for a few different brands, but did I hear you correctly? And that when you set out to make Ranchero sellers that, that it was, it was white first for you? It was white first and in 08 when I started the brand, um, I was working for an, a now defunct label called Edward Sellers and we were making a couple of um, Rhone white, we made a Roussan and we made a Rhone blend. And of all the of all the Rhone whites that I was working with, Grenache Blanc was my favorite and I didn't have a, I didn't have a venue to, to, to make a, a full Grenache Blanc so I decided to do it on my own. I got my fruit those first years from a from a grower that, like Joe was talking about, I really sort of had to talk him into um, planting white grapes, um, and it's it's kind of sad uh, to this day. I have I still have that conversation with people because the the money is not there. They put as much as much work into growing the grapes, but they somehow can't command a high enough price for the white grapes that it just makes, it makes planting these big reds a little bit more financially attractive to them. Um, but anyway, I did start, I did start by making Grenache Blanc and um, I've, I've since evolved. I've gone to a different vineyard and um, I just think that as far as the Paso Robles wine growing uh, goes, 
it's just if you plant some nice high acid whites like the Rhones that are that are custom to the south of France, um, maybe 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 Burgundian varietals aren't what we do best here, but something like Sauvignon Blanc that's that's got a, a really good acidic core or Grenache Blanc that has a really good um, brightness to it, it it can really thrive here with our cool nights and our and our warm days. And you have to yeah. watch what you pick too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of Sauv Blanc, uh, Terry. Uh, you know, we'll get into the wine in a minute, but um, you know, I've known you, Terry, for a little while, and I know that you've made some really great Chardonnays out there. I know your own brand was really kind of focused more on, on the Rhones, and now you're working with a little bit of Sauve Blanc, and, and I don't know if you've worked with it before, but we had a, an interesting question already, actually, on the chat here. Does Sauve Blanc do well in the heat? Uh, is it cooler where the grapes are from? Um, love for you to answer that, but also talk a little bit about Sauve Blanc and making it uh, here in the area and, and your experience in, in other wines, uh, white wines from the region. Yeah, I mean, I've, we've made, uh, like for my own brand, I, I do a uh, Rousson Grenache Blanc blend. It's called the Avery, and I've done that for a long time. Um, and uh, I fully agree with Amy. It's it, our really cool nights is what keeps the acid uh, uh, in the whites. Uh, and generally, we pick the whites pretty pretty early in the harvest. Uh, so as far as the Sauv Blanc goes, uh, um, you know, we pass it. What keeps our acid in the wine is, is, is our cool nights. We might get warm days, but we get really nice cool nights. And, you know, that works on the red wines. It also works really well on the white wines. Uh, as the Sauv Blanc is always the very first wine that's picked here at uh, Le Vigne, and it's usually picked in August. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it doesn't usually have to go through any of those heat spikes that we get, like, usually the first or second week of September. You know, it's like uh, when we get the early heat spikes around Wine Fest, uh, it doesn't matter because the grapes aren't out there yet. So, uh, uh, you know, and then uh, by the time we go to pick it, uh, it it's it always comes in really nice and even actually before I worked here, um, I, the Sauv Blanc from Levine was one of my favorite Sauv Blancs in the area. Um, so uh, you know, it, when coming in, I knew it was it was already good. So my job was not to screw it up basically, and just find a yeast that works really well with it and it, and sort of shows that character with um, it never has any of that um, New Zealand um, cat piss or uh, you know, character to it. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a nice, uh, more melony, fresh, uh, Sauv Blanc. And so I don't think it's really been affected, at least since I've been here by the heat, you know, um, uh, so it, it does, again, it's, it ripens so early that it's off so soon that it doesn't really hang out there that long. It's not like, you know, it's sitting through mid September when we tend to get more heat here. Uh, it's, it's, it's off pretty quickly. Um, and I think that's somewhat true with a lot of the, other than Roussan maybe, but uh, a lot of the other uh, uh, white varietals. Do you guys pick them all pretty early generally or? Amy? Yeah, I think I think I like to go in around 22, 23 bricks and grab those whites um, before they get before they get too much hang time on them. Um, I think that it maintains the freshness. But what I noticed about your Sauv Blanc, just because I'm sipping on all three wines right now, is that it has a lot of those ripe Sauvignon Blanc characteristics. It's not green at all. So I think that, and but it maintains that really good acidity in the mouth. And I, I love that about this wine. It's, it's estery too, it's really fresh. Um, but uh, you were asking about picking decisions and I was like, oh, the Sauvignon Blanc is delicious. <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I do, I do. I do tend to go in a little bit earlier. I think even earlier than some of my friends um, pick their grapes. To kind of weigh in on that as well. I mean, um, to me, the core of white wines, and especially here in Paso, just because we do have such fluctuation between heat and cold, acidity is the core. I mean, you're always chasing the acidity, um, and you're you're hoping that you know, depending on your location, you're able to 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 keep the sugars down, and you can and, and focus in on the city, so you can have an alcohol that's a little bit more um, desirable. I mean. I hate when you get anything over 14% alcohol. I really feel like you just, you lose the freshness um, and then the booziness starts to, to, to kind of take over. Um, some of the varietals I work with um, are a little bit later and it has nothing to do with uh, choice. It's more of like Pickpool and Claret, which are 
um, Rome varietals that are a little bit more obscure are late ripeners. Um, so the Picbo and Claret are some of the latest things that we pick. And reason being why it's good to be farmed in Paso. Um, whereas the Viognier in this area tends to be on the little bit more on the earlier side, another one that we do. Sauvignon Blanc, I agree, that would, uh, depending on where you're at here in Paso, that would be probably one of the first things you would pick. It was one of the first things we picked when I was doing it. Um, and, uh, and Grenache Blanc, site specific at that point, you know, Grenache Blanc can really change over the course of, of the Appalachian uh, where it kind of fits in. But one, nonetheless, I, I totally agree. It's all about freshness and acidity. And, um, you know, I think in, in the past, you know, this was such a red wine region that I think, you know, even myself was maybe picking things with a red wine mentality. And it kind of, you have to teach yourself to get into that white wine mentality of picking earlier, picking for acidity and freshness. And then depending on if you, if you want the option of taking it fully through malolactic and, and having a core white wine that has more texture um, rather than just trying to kind of pigeonhole it to a spot and then picking it for that. It's the white wine thing is very different. It's a, it's a very different animal. With the you, think there's, you think that there's a, for Paso anyway, any specific sites or maybe AVAs within Paso that are a little better or do you think there are any soils maybe even that are a little better or is it just all varietal specific? I think everybody can weigh in on that. Terry, why don't you start? Yeah, I, I think it's somewhat varietal specific. I mean, there's some really, the, the west side definitely has some really nice, it, it's so different on the way it's sloped that uh, you, know, you can have areas that are more cooler uh, and you, you know, different soils. Uh, uh, but, you know, I mean, we, we're here on the east side and that's the Saint Blanc comes out, you know, for, we're not far from the airport. It comes out really nice. So, uh, but again, it's an early pick. Um, the, the vineyard's really well established. It's been here for probably about, uh, Saint Blanc's been in probably about 12 years. So it's about a 12 year old vineyard. So the roots are pretty well established. Um, it doesn't really suffer for water. Uh, you know, it, 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 it just, I think irrigation is part of it. I think the site specific is definitely key. Uh, in general, uh, for the Browns, uh, I I would say that there's really nice areas on uh, you know, especially uh, in the Adelaide uh, district and and in uh, you know Temple Gap and 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 the uh, Willow Creek district. But at the same time, I've gotten really pretty round whites from uh, um, off of. Uh, uh, What's that road out there? Uh, not Geneseo, but but out that direction. Elfamar. Uh, thank you, Elfamar. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there's some nice whites out there that are really pretty. I've had some Vignet from there that's made incredible Vignet. You yeah. know, and and, uh, and Vignet is a tricky one too because you almost have to pick that one. That's a tricky one. You have to pick it higher to get the stone fruit, but then you get the alcohol. So it's it's balance. That's a really tough balancing act for that one more than anything else. It's like you mm -hmm. want that pretty peach apricot you have to get it you know up higher on sugars which then comes back and haunts you a little bit later so you have to you know as winemakers we're always that's why none of us have fingernails we're always you know biting our nails wondering how this is going to work so yeah or drinking uh well you know that, that yeah you know with the, the famous saying i'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy there you go <laughs> I haven't heard that one, but I'm going to remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, chime in on, on, on that about you you sourced fruit from all over the, the AVA. Oh, I thought you were gonna have me charm in about chime in about the lobotomy, but no. Um <laughs> no, he's giving that for me. All over, but mostly on the west side for whites. And um I have noticed that. The Adelaide district is is absolutely gorgeous for for one reason, and that's that it's it's pretty high elevation and it's very warm, and you get those like Terry was saying those stone fruit characteristics in the in the in the fruit, and then this 2019 the chrome that we have right now is the first year I've I've sourced my fruit from Willow Creek district for for white grapes, and it's it's very different and it's it's a lot leaner. And it's not as rich tasting, and it's got more minerality to it. Could be the site, but I think it's I think it's the it, it is the site. But I mean, it it, it it's definitely um, it's definitely different. Um, I've never 
made, have I ever made Viognier or whites off the east side? I don't think that I have. I think they've all been west side, but I've made a lot of them. Um, I do think the cool, the cool nights uh, of the west side, uh, the coolness of the west side is probably better for white grapes, but like Terry was mentioning, the El Pomar district, they get a lot of that Templeton Gap breeze, and I think that really cools things off there. So that I could see that being a really good source for, for white grapes. Yeah, absolutely. I know that we've had a few guests actually on when they've shown uh, some white wines that we've had, uh, and we've had them, you know, doing El Pomar district and it, uh, that always seems to be that sweet spot too. But then of course, we've also had Shannon Blanc from the Highlands district uh, back when we've, mm -hmm. we, I think uh, somebody from Miller family, I believe it was. And so, and those, those show well, re uh, really well as well. Yeah, uh, some, oh, sorry. Oh, go I, ahead. I was going to weigh in real quick. It just, some of the things you see from the Appalachian kind of perspective is that, you know, on the West side, when you're dealing with so much more stone and, and chalk, you know, there's an, a minerality profile that you're going to get much more in, in Willow Creek. And then Adelaide, you're going to cross over into some of the clays that you're going to get, you know, on that proportion. So that does weigh into the elevation and the, the extremes. As you make your way into Templeton Gap in the, in the El Pomar Gap, you're, you're, you're dealing with cooler, cooler nights. I mean, the coldest of the cold. And as you wake to El Pomar, you really do get more loamier soil. So I think what you end up finding is that you can pick those a little earlier with the right acidity. Um, so it's nicer because, and in, in, in when you go into Geneseo and Crest in, in Estrella, you get into the sand. And then at that point, like even where Terry's at, you're, you're able to really pick at a really nice sugar with a ton of freshness and acidity. And I think that's the biggest barometer of, of the differences is the soils itself is what really kind of dictates, you know, your acidity that you're grabbing. And then that kind of in turn dictates what you're going to get um, from sugar and phenolics. And that was the biggest thing for me as you, once you get up on the hills, your challenge is how much acidity and how much minerality are you, are you able to continue to um, evolve knowing that you're going to get a pretty strong sugar as you wait for that. So that's right. the trick. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. find that you're waiting for the peak pool to, for the acid to come down before you pick? Some of the, I, when I was on Glen Rose, definitely. Um, this this particular one's over on Old Oak, so a little bit more ground, a little bit more soil, a little more topsoil. That's helpful. Right. And, I'm, and I'm finding there, there is that no I, topsoil in Glen Rose. No. Yeah, you've all been out there, you know. Um, and I and I actually prefer it off of the off the Old Oak, which is um, Leona's um, originally, uh, Willow Creek. But the topsoil really just does help to give it more. It gives the chance. It gives the vine a chance to kind of evolve itself and not be pushed um, uh, on the sugar side. You know, so it can actually respire the acid longer. It doesn't get sugar spikes as, as much, and you don't really have as much irrigation issues as well as far as having enough water. Um, so I, I think that's the thing too is that I wish we could find more growers that in some of these low ground spots in even on the west side, especially if they could get away from trying to do big reds and maybe doing more elegant whites in those spots because they're a little bit more well-suited for it. Yeah. And the Glen Rose Vineyard, I mean, I tease Don all the time that he scraped all the topsoil off, but uh, uh, <laughs> it, it is an amazing vineyard. I've made some, some of my favorite wine, white wines from that vineyard. Uh, Don's totally crazy and uh, I love him for that, but, uh, uh, and, uh, but he's, uh, he's quite a character, but, uh, the, He's yelled at all wine. at one point. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, yeah. He likes okay. Amy. I don't know. I mean, maybe he likes Amy more. <laughs> but, yeah, the, the, one, the one you made from there, though, it's, it's, it makes an incredible, uh, you can make incredible wine from it. You just have to really watch uh, when you have to pick because you have days between being perfect and not being perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Between, <laughs> between underripe and raisins, it's like, it seems like it's minutes. So yeah, like, it's, it's two days. <laughs> hey, we have a question from the Facebook side of things. Uh, how do you guys think you would do uh, in a blind tasting of Grenache Blanc, Peak Pool Blanc, and Claret Blanche? Uh, do you, what, what features are going to distinguish each one? And so maybe rapid fire here, let's just say for Grenache Blanc, for Peak Pool Blanc, and for Claret Blanche, one, one thing that just says that great. Joe, go. Uh, peak pool is the, to me, you're, you're going to get that, 
man. It really just depends on the sites. I don't want to get too rapid fire. Is like people, you're going to get freshness to city. Um, I think with mint, with Grenache Blanc, you're going to get the minerality. Um, and then with Claret, you're going to get uh, more mouthfeel, more, uh, more, uh, more length and, 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 and breadth to it. Um, just as spitfire and without getting too crazy, I'll let you guys all wait. Yeah. And here, here in Paso, Claret is the least acidic of those three varieties. Yeah. Sometimes it, French people will say that Grenache Blanc doesn't have a lot of acidity, but we find that it does here. And then the peak pool is going to have that real fresh lime. The, the, uh, the Grenache Blanc is going to be more apple and mineral. It tastes like apple pie and rocks, I like to say. And um, the Claret is, like, like Joe said, it's going to have more mouthfeel just because it doesn't have as much acidity. Yeah, I, uh, Grenache Blanc, uh, I, I would agree totally with Amy. Um, I think we get actually great acid for Grenache Blanc, which is not that common. A lot of, when you get some from other areas, like Canon and Sunday Nez, they seem to be a little bit more rich. And we get some really nice character to ours. It keep the acidity really keeps it focused. And uh, I, I love the freshness we get from Grenache Blanc um, here. Don't have a lot of uh, experience with uh, Claret. I've never actually made it, so I can't. I mean, speak to it as far as a, a wine on the winemaking side. Uh, on the drinking side, I like it, but you know, that's the drinking side, that's easy. Um, <laughs> but Peak Pool, I love Peak Pool. Um, Peak Pool's one of my favorite little grapes out there. Um, and uh, it just, it just, it's, it's got this sort of subtle fruit character that comes out that just, just makes it just, you, you taste it and it, it's sort of sneaky. And you're like, all of a sudden, you're like, oh my God, that's, that's great. So, you know, that's, I, that's what I love about people. It's not like in your face. It's just there, and and it's sort of sneaks around the side and 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 makes you happy. So mm -hmm. awesome, thank you. So hey, Terry, while you're talking, why don't we start talking about wine because we're actually at three thirty now. Uh, so yeah. first wine uh, is the Sauvignon Blanc by Lavigne. I really dig the new silk screen label, by the way, with the blue background. Woo! Hey, this thanks, guys. Rad. Yeah, this was actually the. The hardest one to do because with Sauv Blanc, um, when you put the white writing on and you put it on the shelf, you can't read anything because uh, it's so clear on the Flint bottle. So we had to put the black or probably the blue background on it and then come up with the back label. So that th this was the, the most challenging of all the new labels we did that this was the interesting one. But uh, of course my phone decides now to go off with everybody calling me. Um, <laughs> so sorry, if I'm bored, take your time. But uh, yeah, so uh, our, like I said, our sub blanc is always the first one picked. We ferment it really coolly. We ferment it just above 55 degrees, 55 to 57. It takes weeks to go dry. Um, so we get those nice esters by just really slowly doing that. Um, I worked in Oregon for a number of years and uh, we did a, a lot of uh, uh, Rieslings. We used to do a dry Riesling up there and um uh and some and pinot gris uh and um i th they fermented it that way up there and i really love the characters that it got as as opposed to like the open man and uh you know because you really can control the temp and it just it creeps up ever so slowly uh you know or it creep, drops down ever so slowly on the bricks i should say um and it really just creates these beautiful esters and that's uh that's the way I've been doing it here. And then just fine tuning the yeast we use, you know, little BL1, BL3, QA23. Those are all really fun yeast to, and I like to do sort of a combination of those, um, not all in one tank, um, and then blend them back. So, yeah. It just Terry, you you're relatively new. Flavor. This post for you over there at Lavigne is relatively new for you. Um, are you, it, are you changing things around now over there as far as winemaking is concerned? I mean, Lavigne has always made some really nice wines, but it, you know, this, this wine in particular, when I think about it compared to maybe a, a Sauv Blanc that I've had in the past, there's definitely a, a difference in this wine. There's, there's a certain freshness element and brightness element that seems different maybe than, than times past. Are you, what, what are you doing different? I think some of that's the yeast uh, uh, choices, uh, uh, basically. Uh, Michael uh, used to ferment it cool too. Um, I just make sure it's, you know, just just creeps along basically. And, and uh, you know, we, we talk, I talk nice to the tank every time I go by it. Maybe that helps, I don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Be good, please. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, it's, you know, I learned how to make wine by making Pinot. So uh, I've always learned how to talk nice to the barrels and everything. Because Pinot, if you say one bad word, it's gone. So uh, you have to be gentle with them. Um, Thin skin. That's why I've been married for 35 years. That's good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you were very well. That's fine. What are you thinking? Uh, I, I just love the fact that, like, even um, Amy alluded to at the beginning, the the esters and like that. There's a those there's like these tropical textures that um, aren't, I would say, prototypical to a Paso Sauvignon Blanc and especially stuff coming over on those sandy ground over off Australia. I mean, yeah, there's there's a richness to it. And actually, when you're talking about the dry riesling, I kind of got that that almost like riesling profile a little bit i mean not obviously in the fruit but almost in the that texture and in that kind of nose element and it's a really pretty sauvignon blanc man you should be proud good job thanks buddy appreciate it yeah it's uh it's it's got almost the the, the weight a little bit of that riesling weight to it i think mm -hmm. so, um uh, but again the slow fermentation is key to that and i you know uh as long as the uh, chillers don't go out on a hot day, we're, we're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, does this uh, make you want to source a little Sauv Blanc from the east side, considering you're not really sourcing fruit from over there? Um, yes, it absolutely does. But what it also makes me want to do is just finish this bottle after we get off the phone. <laughs> but, um, hey, it's right at 14%. You can do it. You're good. 14? Is that what it's at? Oh, yeah, 14.1. Perfect. Well, you can't be at 14. The TTV hates that. So you have to 14.1. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. if you if you want to go, if you go down on taxes, it's not a good thing. So we always just go up on taxes. So there you go. The yep. day drinker right there. <laughs> I like this wine quite a bit. Um, I like that melon. You know, Terry talked about it having a melon characteristic, and I really like that. Honeydew. Honeydew, yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. I always say like if I have to come up with a melon, I will say heirloom melon. Huh. I don't know what melon it is, but it's definitely it's definitely an heirloom variety. <laughs> that, right. kind of, that kind of covers a lot of territory. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Gotta look for that next time in the Ranchero yeah. Cellars tasting notes. It's never, <laughs> and it's never, it's never just jasmine. It's always night blooming pink jasmine. <laughs> but Amy's called me an heirloom variety too, so there you go. <laughs> you are certainly one of a kind, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely heirloom for sure. <laughs> Let's taste the Grenache Blanc. Amy, talk a little bit about it. Um, this Grenache Blanc uh, is pretty, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of sad because these guys are showing their 2020s and my 2020 is not yet in the bottle. So I better get on that. Um, but uh, this is fermented. I ferment my Grenache Blanc in uh, concrete. A little bit of concrete and a little bit of neutral oak. So I have this concrete pyramid that takes that takes most of the volume, and I like that because it has um, a great. Uh, it's, there's no cooling or heating on it, but it has really good thermal mass. So if I put cold juice in it, it usually stays cold, and then I let it ferment on its own. I don't add yeast. So. Um, that just means that it's getting a low inoculum of whatever's floating around the winery. I have no. Um, I have no illusions about native yeast. <laughs> I know that what's fermenting my wine is whatever the strongest strain in the winery is, but it's a low inoculum and it starts and the, the fermentation goes long, just like Terry was saying with the Sauv Blanc. It goes long and cool, it doesn't really spike in temperature, so it maintains whatever fruit character I can get. I don't know if the concrete enhances the minerality, but um, this wine certainly has minerality um, going on for it. It's definitely, it's got some lemon and some apple, but it's also um, got that real white stone minerality that comes from Willow Creek District. I'm still getting used to this site. And what, what's really unfortunate about this vineyard is that it had red blotch and the grower, Bill Gibbs, ripped it out. So there's no more Grenache Blanc on that site. Oh, Over at G3? Is that... Over at G3. G3 sorry. Well, that was a drafted over Zen block at one point. Yeah, uh, I believe that was that little east face area, kind of like that northeast, southeast, southeast facing. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. that was a good. That was the. That was I remember him tearing that out when it was back with Johnny Christmas when he owned it. It was a little gem, and it sadly, yeah. sadly, it's gone. And of course, he's replanting it to red varieties, 
because you can command a higher price for that. And not, not just that, but I think the demand for G3 fruit is, is through the roof. So G2, sorry, I, I misspoke G2, right? G2. G3 yeah. is a whole, that is a whole different thing. <laughs> G3, we're I said that because we're actually doing some work with G3 uh, logistics. And so it's like, it just came to mind. So I'm yeah. sorry. She's stepping ahead. She's already moved beyond that. She's like, I'm not I'm even not on, on G2 anymore. anymore. I'm on G3. G2, <laughs> G3, G3, whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then the uh, the panelists on the fit, that is a vineyard site. So uh, G2 and G3 is a vineyard site. So I'm going to just, I'm going to weigh in. G2 is a vineyard site. G3 is a, is a Gallo owned company that does a lot of wine related things, but not, um, yeah. not, uh, not necessarily uh, vineyard. Yeah. Aren't they, isn't that what they were doing on the capsules? I think those are capsules, our capsules. Screw caps. Logistics, trucking. Wow. Wow, so, you bet. So you know. Let's just stop for a sponsor moment. G3. <laughs> <laughs> I would like a cut of that action, please. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't take 1%. 1% is all I ask. <laughs> it's a nice cross blonde, uh, Amy. It's really, really pretty. Very it's aromatic. Gorgeous, I like yeah. the blonde. Yeah, I love the minerality too, Amy. It's, it's, you know, uh, do you think some of that's from the, the concrete? Because I know you definitely have it from the vineyard also, so. I don't um, know. I don't, I don't think, like when I do my Viognier in concrete, I don't find that it enhances the minerality. I feel like the stone fruit just really rocks through, but, uh -huh. but it, could, it could have something to do with the concrete fermentation. I'm thinking now I'm thinking because I like the esters in yours so much I'm thinking that maybe I will use yeast next time I do this and like get some nice ester production that that I can then trap in the bottle and maybe bottle a little bit earlier um I think the the fruitiness of of the of the um the yeast impact could be it could be a boon to this wine yeah the indigenous character though I mean you know even though we don't know what it is but uh this wine is really gorgeous for, you know, I'm, I'm always scared to do whites with indigenous yeast. Uh, I do it, I've done it with reds a bunch, but um, whites have always made me nervous. So um, I always break down the yeast. Yeah, because they show whatever, whatever's there, white, white wine shows it. And it, it's definitely, the, you can't hide anything in a white wine. Yeah, you that's know very true. There's, you know what's funny is, um, on this pickful, we did both. We did a stain, indigenous, but we did stainless and barrel. And I, I feel like it's the temperature that really enhances that, you know, that because you know, the barrels are always going to get warmer and the stainless is we're going to be able to control a lot more. And that was the funnest thing that we got to see on pickful, this particular block especially, was to see that temperature kind of relationship and to see the esters on the cool side and the the glycerin and the, the volume that were on the warmer ferments on, on lees or at least in barrique um certainly made a difference and i've done co i've done uh concrete as well and it's i haven't probably done it as long as amy and my poor tank cracked so i can't do it anymore <laughs> but uh, i always love the the variety that that brought in especially with the concrete because it was you never really could put your finger on what it did but it seemed to do something good <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean i got to play with some concrete when i was at, uh helping out at peachy over there and it was uh um it was it was really fun to play with concrete but uh you know it's like a barrel once it's you know, if you make it a red it's a red from then on right mm -hmm. so uh we definitely freaked doug out when we put red wine in it one time and he didn't know so it was a good time <laughs> <laughs> that's good for i'm him. curious as to like if you what could there be a, a, a big difference say with grenache blanc in particular concrete barrel stainless like what what kind of difference would we see whether it be in the nose or in the mouth um, as, as, long as, as long as you um maintain the temperature uh a stainless or concrete is going to be um it's going to be a lot leaner the um the barrel ferment both with the least contact and with the the temperature the lack of temperature control in a barrel it's kind of like what Joe said about his peak pool. It's a lot. It's a lot fleshier, and he he said like a glycerol characteristic that comes through in the mouth. It's definitely a um, a mouthfeel thing. I think you also get riper fruit characteristics out of a barrel. Yeah, I think I, I think the barrel too. If you with the surly, it gives it a roundness. Um, you know, like I I, I 
I would use totally neutral, like six year old, um, you know, uh, white barrels and on our Grenache Blanc and our Roussan. And it, it was, uh, so you know, barrel impact, but you still get a warmth and a, a, of, of the wood and the surly contact that sort of gives it a different character that's really nice to blend back with some stainless, you know, um, and some concrete because it's, it's a whole different animal. Um, but it, it, it just gives it a, a sort of, yeah, a harmony, I guess, from the wood um, that's really nice. Um, and I've always enjoyed doing some of it in really old, you know, right before you're going to get rid of them, uh, neutral oak. Uh, they're not bilgy yet. They're still nice and, you know, clean barrels, but they, they that older barrel um, gives you a really nice character. And I learned actually that from Josh at Calera because he always did his is Viognier in six-year-old uh, barrels, neutral French barrels that were left over from Chardonnay for all those years. And, and then the next year they go away, right? So that's the, the last year we used them. And so it was 100% barrel ferment in these totally neutral uh, Viognier barrels or, or wood, uh, French barrels that were just really pretty. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, and I, do, I do like the wood character on there too. Yeah, and the the wood. But it's not oaky by any means. It's just a warm. So much the texture comes from the the, the that kind of um, uh, contact with the leaves, and then the fact that you're 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 really having more of a, a, a you know more of a surface contact with those leaves, and it's more impacting. And you yeah. can kind of manipulate it a little bit more. I mean, I think it's the batonage kind of thing, and everybody can play that game a little bit more. And that's what's cool about white wines. I think it's the one thing that people don't discuss, and I'm glad we're discussing it now. Is like all the variabilities that you can really do with whites on a fermentation and you know immediately after fermentation manipulation that really does make the wine and gives it a message and gives it a style um it can be from the same site i mean I, I, me and amy could get some fruit from the same fields pick the same day and we can make a completely different wine and same with with terry it's like the signature of the winemaker gets to be a little bit more apparent um, I feel like and whites and there's no messing around with whites. I'll always say this with whites. Whites like making beer. You have one shot at it. Right. You don't, yeah. there's not a lot of fudge factor. You miss something, you let it get too warm or you, you, you kind of stray or you forget about it. You, there's not a lot of, um, uh, you don't it doesn't come back from that. Yeah. You know, reds are a little bit more elastic. You know, they can kind of come and go and you watch them breathe and you watch them mature and, and, and they have a lot of reduction that is in your favor. Whereas whites, you don't have that luxury at times. So you're always, you're always on the clock. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and if you miss it, man, you miss it. And it's, there's no going back. And that's, I have a lot of respect for people who make white wines well is because they're, they're very, um, you know, almost dogmatic with how they roll, roll, roll with it and, and make sure that they uh, do it well. I, I yeah. once heard, uh, I think it was Richie that said, like, if you, uh, you can't hide any flaws on a white wine, like you can potentially on a red wine through blending or whatever it might be. Uh, you're white. That's, that's, it is what it is. So. Very transparent. Yeah. 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 There's no hiding it. White wines hold grudges. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you talk dirty to it or bad to yeah. it. It's, 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 it's mad. It holds a grudge. <laughs> well, before we move on to Pic Pou Blanc, I didn't put the label up, but I did want to put the Ranchero Cellars label up like I did with the other, and, and I just- I'll do it too. Uh, your label yeah, yeah. is- Woo! I'll do it, yeah. That's cool. Oh! Yes, absolutely. Um, hey, hey, what does this retail for? That is a $30 bottle. All right. Oh, uh, Terry, back to the Saab Blanc. 20. 20. All right, moving on, we are going to the Barton. Pick Tiny Dancer. You want me to play Tiny the song? Tiny Dancer. I don't, have, I don't have it queued up, so I can't play the song. I'm sorry about that. I love the hand label too, buddy. Good job. I can barely you lift know, this bottle. You know, when you- uh, What's with the top? Everybody else has screw taps and- You know, I'm just trying to kind of overdo it, and that's how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the wax, wax on, wax off. Wax off, wax off. I know. I, this package cost me way too much money to do. I will tell you that already. Um, but, you know, I, I think we want to, I mean, for us and for me, if you look at it, it's, we made a hundred and, I don't know, 125 cases of that. So it's it's meant to be handcrafted, you know, and if that if that's, you know, the, the storyline behind it and we can we can make that kind of 
showcasing the package. That's what it's all about. And, and I don't know, that's, that's designer stuff too. Cause I still have not found a bottling line yet that I can do that label on. It's real tricky when you silk screen something and then you try to put a label on it. Um, I have not found a bottling line that will do that well yet. So we do hand label all that, which yeah. I'm doing that with all, all my spirits too, which that's another bad idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, pick pull, we were talking about it earlier. Uh, what a great variety for Paso. I hope everybody plants more pick pull because it does so well here in all parts of Paso too, which is one of those things that we were talking about. It's like not all the varietals excel in Paso on all the different AVAs. Um, I think pick pull would do well all over the place, mostly because it has an acidity core that if you were able to you know, understand the idea of it and pick it to its position, you will always get something that's nice, that's friendly, that's pretty, and that will represent Paso Robles well. So, and it's a good yielder. I don't know why people don't plant more of it. Everybody loves it. You know, it's a great drinker regardless. Um, and we do it in a style that is um, meant to be very natural, very, we do it all native. Um, Brad and I have really moved into that kind of mentality of full native, full natural malolactic and taking everything through malolactic so that we can hopefully um, try to go without filtration if at all possible. I mean, obviously not like, you know, we may have to do some bit of media to make sure it doesn't have any fuzzy stuff in it. But <laughs> nonetheless, we want to try to be as, as natural with the, uh, the whole process and as well. And uh, the site's great. Um, old Oak is a very old vineyard site. Um, Leona's Vineyard is what it used to be called. Um, so Leona was married to Pat Mastin or Pasquale or, you know, whatever we wanted to, whatever he wanted to call himself at the time. And uh, a lot of old history there, a lot of old history in that road. It's Willow Creek Road. It's a very unique spot um, through there. And uh, I, it's head trained uh, dry farm. So that's another kind of cool kind of ideology with it is trying to kind of take this old school. And uh, Jordan uh, Collins, Neil's son has been kind of helping out with the farming and, and really directing the farming now. So it's fun to, my, my winemaker Brad and, and I, um, I've mostly been friends with Neil for a long time as is Terry and Amy and then Jordan and Brad are super tight. So it's kind of cool relationships all the way through. Like he's making theirs and we're making ours and we're being very kind of um, interactive with each other as far as the farming and the, and the winemaking. And it's cool. Like this is old school Paso stuff of the, you know, the, uh, the friendships and the relationships. And um, you know, if anybody who's, if, and if you're somebody who's on these Facebook things a lot, um, there's a lot more of this around this area than maybe you might not understand is like there's just cool relationships that have been lasted for years i mean amy and i lived next door to each other for four or five years next door to bill sheffer who was another winemaker with who was next door to jake beckett and i've known terry probably for probably 15 years uh and i know the lineage of all the people that you came from and it's it's just really cool to kind of hang out and do this and and uh, i think this wine's all about that same mentality so i hope you guys enjoy it yeah, that's awesome. So did you have a say in them planting pig pool at that site? No, that was all Neil. <laughs> that was all Neil. That's Neil. That was Neil's baby. Yeah. Uh, he, he got he got him to, to do that. There's pig pool. There's Grenache Blanc. Um, I think that's all on the whites. And then uh, Grenache, Kunwa, I think some Cinso. I think he actually had him, got him to plant Vakaras there too. Oh, wow. Crazy. You, yeah. Who, whose peak pool did you take when you, when you took this? <laughs> oh, it was just, he was, it was more of like, there was more, there was always going to, it started to yield up more and it was going to be a little bit more than Neil needed. So I was, I was on the waiting list. So when it, you know, when it opened up, I, I pounced, <laughs> you know, he said, you want some? I'm like, absolutely. And then like we said before, I'd, I'd gotten some from um, Glen Rose before. So, you know, it, it, two very different ideologies. And then like we get Grenache Blanc from Paper Street across the way. So um, you do kind of start seeing uh, the soil kind of profiles that are very kind of really identify the, the, the wines and really make the wines more than anything. It's just such a the big player in all of it. It's, you know, the winemaking is important, but the, the terroir is obviously a large play in that. I find this wine very, it's texture so much different 
than the other two Blancs, where it is a little fleshier. It does have still that really bright acidity that you expect out of people, but I do find it having uh, a lot more texture, a lot more mouthfeel uh, than, uh, than the other two wines that are, of course, similar in nature because all three wines are meant to be quite acidic, I suppose. Amy, what are you liking out of this wine? I like the barrel influence and I, I've, I don't think, I think this might be the first time I've consciously tasted a peak pool that has that, um, that oak character in it and the barrel fermentation character. Yeah. Um, I think that people tend to play peak pool um, in, a, in a really lean way with stainless fermentation and maybe not, maybe not try, try to coax that, that richer mouthfeel out of it. And I think it, it really shows well. And I'm I'm impressed with this uh, this bottling. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I agree with Amy fully that the the influence of the barrels are, are they predominantly neutral, Jerry? Yeah. Or? yeah, I don't. There might be a second fill in there, but it's it's predominantly neutral. Yeah, because it just gives that, and, and that's what I was talking about earlier on on you know the Grenache Blanc that I liked it, and there was a little bit of neutral oak that gives gives you a a. a sort of a warmth up to the wine, not heat like alcohol by any means, but like just, a, you know, it sort of rounds the edges <laughs> off. Um, when you go steely, sometimes you get really edgy, you know, like sharp, you know, corners and things on the on the wine on your palate. And I always think of a, I, I'm geeky that way, sorry, but, uh, you know, I think of st stainless steel being sort of edgy and then the barrel just sort of rounds everything out. And it just, it really is a beautiful wine. It comes out that way. And it, what I love is the way it lays about your palate and it just sort of really nicely slides down from the finish. It's, it's a really well done wine. Well, and I think, uh, you know, with speaking to you, you guys, you know, on the winemaking levels that, and what we were talking about earlier is like, it was the pick. I mean, it was really more about making sure you didn't overdo it. You didn't kind of just like try to think like overthink it, you know what I mean? Where you're like, oh, I need it. You know, sometimes we can be tasting berries and we're like, mm, no, it could do a little bit more. I feel like with whites around here, you got to call it a little earlier. Um, because you got to see the full evolution of it and not try to think like, you know, red wines were like spot on, like today's the day, get the pickers out there. White wines, you kind of got to be like, I need this to be good. Not quite exactly. Cause I know the evolution in the barrel is going to be different and the, and the alcohol is 13.5. So I'm stoked that it was 13.5. That was not intentional, but I was really hoping that's where it ended up. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's like pasta, right? You want El Dente. Totally. You, know, if, you don't want flabby pasta, right? <laughs> That's right. actually the best comparison I could possibly think of. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> that was no great, Jerry. Pasta, no flabby whites. Yes, no, no flabby, flabby whites. whites. No. Can we make a group? Can we make? Can we start a Paso group of no flabby whites? Uh, I love that one. I, That's gonna be a great work out though. No working out. <laughs> no working out. Don't hang the sign in your tasting room because no one will come in. <laughs> <laughs> secret society <laughs> that was pretty good we had to finish strong man we had to finish strong <laughs> oh, I, mean, so I don't know um, alright so we are actually coming up on the end of the show and before we do that, though, I do want to, I, a great conversation, actually, honestly, I feel like we could definitely keep going, but I don't want to keep you guys any longer and all of our audience too. Uh, so I do want to get you guys a quick, one quick question. And Joe kind of already said, we need to plant more uh, Peak Pool Blanc, but let's just say of the three great varieties that uh, we've talked about today, what one of those needs to be planted more and then what white are we missing that needs to be planted more in Paso? And uh, let's start with Amy. What white are we missing that needs to be planted more? Yes, in Paso. And then which one of the three needs we do we need more? So this we is definitely need more peak pool. I've, I've only made peak pool once and I only had one chance on it and I did the edgy thing with the stainless steel and now I'm now I'm thinking what would it be, What how would it be if I'd fermented it in barrels like Joji does. Um, so uh, we definitely need more of one of those three. And I have to think on what the other variety might be that we need more of, but I'm sure if we need something, Tablas Creek will take care of it. 
It's it's already there. <laughs> yeah, they just haven't announced it yet, but it's coming. And it's probably so obscure that I don't know enough about it. Um, but something Spanish, maybe like Viura. Oh, cool. Awesome. Uh, yeah, actually, speaking of tablas, I'm sorry to, to totally go off on a tangent. I did have that Vaqueras recently. Yeah, super good, huh? Yeah, that was yeah. crazy. It was so good. Got to yeah. get that. Wish we should do a show on that. Uh, all right, so, uh, Terry, uh, same question. Uh, I agree, people, you can't get it. It's uh, These guys have it all locked up, so it's not available. Uh, <laughs> but no, just it's just, if there's not enough and everybody, I, I would love to have something to play with. So, uh, but uh, I think Alvarino, I think we could do some really pretty Alvarino. Um, and there's not a lot of it out there. Uh, you know, it's not as it's sort of outside the box as we all tend to just do rounds, but you know, uh, I, it, there's some really pretty stuff out there. So yeah, yeah. You find it. So I, I'd like to see for the missing one, I'd like to see some out here. Yeah. So. We have a comment here about Uni Blanc and that uh, maybe we need more Uni Blanc. Uh, uh, Uni Blanc is not a bad one. It's more of a brandy grape, but it does really well. It's Trebbiano as well. So that's when you're kind of doing the crossover between Italians and and, um, and French, um, but it does well. It needs to be on chalk. That's kind of always the thing we run into is like certain varieties they do really well, um, but it, it some of them are varietal specific as far as you know and soil specific. Um, I would really love to see more Vermentino. Truthfully, oh, I think one. Vermentino is a fantastic varietal for this area. Um, I love the Bureau that. Um, uh, Amy was talking about, and in that same vein, Verdejo is kind of kind of another little playground. Kenny, Kenny was doing that one, wasn't he, Terry? Kenny, you know, Kenny yeah, we also did. Uh, it was Verdello, wasn't it? Alavesia, Bianca, we did everything. Yeah. So there, when you said Kenny was doing that one, he was doing everything. So mm -hmm. uh, exactly. it, it wasn't as great that Kenny didn't do. So yeah, yeah. I don't know if we're, we're ready to go back on the Blau Fonkish train, but uh, yeah. <laughs> It's so, so good. But it's some like, of the like were really good. I bet. Some of Kenny's Kilferman's. Yeah. No, there's a lot of there's a lot of cool. I want to give you guys a quick uh, moment to say what's next for you. Are you doing something virtual? Are you doing something in person? What What are you doing next? That's That's cool. That everybody needs to know about. Joji, go. Uh oh, gosh, that's a big one. <laughs> um, you know, I think for us, it's uh, we're really kind of focusing on um, I don't know, having fun. Brad and I are having fun. You know, we made our first pet nat out of claret. We thought that was cool. We made a carbo, like a lot of other people are doing. So I think there's a lot of really, really cool things that I think a lot of us are experimenting on. Um, I think for me, it's like, I, but I'm staying true to my soul, and I'm really pushing Grenache. Um, I mean, not to get off the white train, but I love Grenache. I think Grenache is the, the king of this appellation and I'm chasing it hard and I'm trying to get as many people to put Grenache on the ground as I can, because I think it's truthfully like Chad enough. I think it's a, it's a superior grape for this area. And I hope, uh, I hope uh, the, the general public becomes, begin or continues to fall in love with that varietal as much as I have. Yeah, right on. I'm, I'm all for that too, buddy. Uh, Amy. I'm not doing anything except uh, I do people my tasting room every Saturday and Fridays and Sundays by appointment. So if you're interested in tasting any of these really cool whites, uh, I just have a Viognier and a Grenache Blanc. But um, what I find sometimes is that people come in and they, they don't want it, they want to skip the whites. And I think, but that's some of my best work. Anyway, um, so come on and see me at the Paso Underground on Saturdays. Yeah, that's downtown, uh, back behind MB, I believe it is. Yeah, it's, it's well hidden, but it's actually been really busy lately. So we're we're getting some good um, some good word of mouth, some good foot traffic. Go to PasoWine.com and you can find uh, Ranchero Cellars, Barton Family, as well as Lavigne, and see their locations, hours, and all that good stuff. Terry, uh, for you, what's what's happening? What's next for you? Uh, well, since I've been here, I've actually switched the rosé program over. So we, we're doing a, a, a Sangiovese rosé that's been really well received. Uh, Sangio is such a, it's got bright acid, it's fresh, it's really crisp. And uh, so we're making our uh, rosé out of that. It's our second vintage out just now. Um, and we're looking at, you know, continuing that. Uh, it's just, Sangio is a natural for rosé. So we're, we're stoked with that. Along with our regular Sangiovese that we do, and and then our Super Tuscan. So uh, 
you know, Walter and Sylvia, Walter's an Italian. So, uh, you know, any super Tuscan thing is a great thing to do. So you can enjoy yeah. that. Um, and uh, yeah, we're having a, a wine fest dinner this weekend. If anybody's interested, they uh, can contact the tasting room here at Le Bignet and and uh, come for, for dinner and try a bunch of different wines. So I, I believe we're pouring the rosé as you come in the door. So there you go. Awesome. I'm glad you mentioned Wine Fest uh, and, the, and the weekend uh, because I did not actually ask you guys uh, to say anything about that. And, and, and I'm, I'm wrong for doing that. Amy, do, are you doing anything over Wine Fest uh, that, that people should know about over this weekend? Not specifically, no, but I will okay. be there. But you'll be in your tasting room, Joji? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know. I'm watching a limo pull up right now, so I'm trying to figure out where they're going. <laughs> uh, well, go to PasoWine.com. Yeah, we will be, but we'll be. Uh, we do have a uh, a five course pairing dinner tomorrow night, oh. um, and uh, that's limited to 50 people. I believe we've already sold like 45 of them or 44. So there's six more spots if you guys would love to come out and hang out. It's going to be uh, uh, specifically paired with five different wines. Um, uh, a core dinner. And then of course we have the Barton kitchen window that we'll be doing food all weekend long. Crowbar craft distillery. If wine's not your bag, we've got your whiskey, we've got your gin, we've got everything else for you. So we'll be doing a, we'll be doing a, a couple custom cocktails throughout the weekend. So uh, come find us. And, uh, and if you uh, have a chance to get out to the rest of the wineries, have fun, man. Uh, do it right for Paso. Awesome. Yeah. If you go to PasoWine.com, you can search by winery, by activity, uh, by day and you can see some of the things that are going on because again we're not doing the big event down in the park but rather promoting all of the individual events that are happening at at least 150 different wineries all around Paso so do go check that out thank you everyone for uh, staying on and and having some fun uh, talking about the Blancs today uh, I want to tell you guys that for the next few shows what we got coming up here uh, so on the 27th we're going to be talking about the Adelaide District uh, we're going to have Tublis Creek, uh, let's see who else, Rangeland Wines, as well as Parish Family, uh, all doing something different out in the Adelaide District, all in different places out there. So we'll be talking rock, soil, all that good stuff. On the 3rd, we're still putting that show together. That'll be June 3rd. Uh, but uh, we've got some of the old school wineries in town. Uh, Caparone is already on, but we're hoping Dunning and Fr Fratelli Parada are going to be on with us. We'll do, we'll check in on the vineyard side of things on the 10th. We try to do that every quarter. Uh, so we'll be talking about what's happening in the vineyard on June 10th. And then on the 17th, we are joining that international uh, coalition uh, that is all about protecting uh, place names. Uh, they're doing a taste-a-thon across the entire globe. Uh, we'll be a part of that one. Check it out. I haven't, I don't will have be Chris. yet set for that one, but that one should be really cool. What, Joji? I bet you will be part of that taste a thon. <laughs> you going to sponsor that thing? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, waited till the end. <laughs> all right. So, anyway, <laughs> thank you everyone for joining in on today's Paso Wine Hour. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Thanks, Cheers, guys. Thanks, Chris. See you guys. Oh. See you guys. All right. Thank See you. Ya. Cheers. Cheers.